welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 467, for the 1st of October 2017. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia, bright, sunny. Where's the rain? Where Where's the rain? We haven't had rain for a while. Things are getting a little bit dry. A little bit dry with record-breaking heat days last month and dry conditions. We uh, think the summer is going to be problematic. But Australia is a uh, a continent of extremes, I guess. We'll see how that goes. Coming up this week on The Skeptic Zone, I talk to author and public speaker Stephen Colgan. Now, I met Stephen some years back at QED, QED in Manchester, where he was one of the speakers, and his uh, talk so impressed me, but I've been, well, more or less uh, trying to catch up with him ever since for an interview. I got that interview, and uh, Stephen's going to talk to us about his method of problem-solving, solving problems before they start and about his book, Why Did the Policeman Cross the Road?, and his forthcoming book, A Murder to Die For. What a fascinating bloke. I'm sure he is a uh, direct descendant of Sherlock Holmes in some mystical way, probably, somehow. I think you'll enjoy this interview with Stephen Colgan. Following that, it's uh, a message, a news item from the Australian Skeptics. They are offering grants. Yes, grants. If you're in Australia and you have a sceptical activity you think uh, needs funding, the Australian sceptics might be able to come to your aid. News on the Australian sceptics' grants coming up a bit later. Then it's Brouhaha Science from the Australia Science TV. And uh, this week, Casey Harrigan says happy birthday to Michael Faraday. Happy birthday, Michael Faraday. Then it's a grain of salt with Iran Segev. He's continuing interviews from the European Skeptics Congress just over, and I hear it was a great success. This week, uh, Iran chats to Claire Klingenberg before and then just after the Congress. Now, Claire's been a guest on the show oh, quite a number of times now, and uh, it's always great to hear her voice Find out how Claire thought the Congress went. And in the coming weeks, um, Iran, he sent me lots of interviews. Uh, in fact, a little bit of a little bit of a uh, spoiler alert. Next week, Iran catches up with James Randi. And then in the weeks following, all sorts of other great people. After that, it's a little item about homeopathy. And uh, I'm shocked to read that homeopathy is still nonsense. <clears throat> homeopathy? It's a never ending saga. It's an evergreen. It's an unsinkable rubber duck in a pond full of homeopathic water. Then to round off the show, again from the European Skeptics Congress, it's Susan Gerbeck from Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, and she's going to have a brief chat to mentalist and paranormal investigator Jacob Krulik about uh, exorcism. And she also catches up with some of her uh, online editors at uh, Guerrilla Skepticism who were at the Congress. Now, here's a little correction, a correction from me. Last week, uh, I told you about the Australian Skeptics Ben Spoon Award and some of the nominations being made. And I mentioned that one of the uh, one of the nominations was for the ABC's TV program Late Line. That was incorrect. It was actually ABC TV's uh, program Land Line, not Late Line. I misread my script. So apologies to the Late Line program, a fine program indeed, but the nomination is for ABC TV's Land Line program for a story extolling the dubious virtues of biodynamic farming and the wonders of burying cow horns full of manure to help wine grow. So that's uh, the nomination for Land Line, not Late Line. Oh, and by the way, there's a new nomination up on the Australian Skeptics webpage for the Bed Spoon for the Metatron, the uh, bizarre device that you hook up to your head and scans your body with magical frequencies and you can see your internal organs down to the level of your DNA. Metatron, worth checking out. That's in the running for the Bed Spoon Award. Now, just a reminder, and in case you didn't know, that the Australian Skeptics have a weekly radio segment 
on Radio 2GB in Sydney, which is uh, networked through the Macquarie Network around Australia. And of course, it's available online. And you can hear the archives of those sessions at 2GB.com if you just go there and search for Saunders or Skeptics or Mendham. Tim Mendham, of course, Tim and I take a, a sort of a tag team. He'll do some weeks and I'll do some weeks. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much to Mike Williams, who's uh, been uh, in the Australian entertainment industry for many years. And he does the overnight uh, weekend show. And it's great fun to be on the show with Mike Williams, chatting about all sorts of things. And the latest uh, uh, segment just went out last night, in fact, was about crop circles. I'll put a link in the show notes. So that's late night, early morning, skeptics on the radio. In fact, you can listen to that live uh, anywhere Uh, in the world via 2gb.com. Stay tuned to the end of the show with my um, Loose Ends segment where we tie up the loose ends from the show, including a message from the new uh, platform we're trying, the new app, Voice Byte. I got a Voice Byte message with a question. And uh, I think you'll all, especially if you're uh, intending to come to Skepticon, in November here in Sydney, I think you'll all be interested in this uh, in this question. Stay tuned for that. But for now, but for now, it's time for me to run downstairs, raid the lolly jar, the candy jar, the sweetie jar, and get some of that incredibly delicious red licorice. I don't know if you've tried red licorice. It's sort of raspberry flavored. Oh, what a combination. Yeah, why not? Well, I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. me now all the way from the UK it's uh, author and public speaker Stephen Colgan hello Stephen hello hello great to catch up with you again now we have met we met at QED in Manchester oh it must have been about 2014 I think it was yeah I think it and was yeah yeah to entice you onto the skeptic zone I mentioned to you that of all the hundreds of talks I've seen around the world in skeptic conventions going back decades probably one of the standout ones was the presentation you gave at uh, QED and I know that because I can still remember large uh, sections of it large swathes of your presentation so uh, well done well done indeed that's very kind and uh, we didn't decide how you wanted your payment do you want it in in (laughs) sterling or or Australian dollars, or no? Yeah. It, was, it was it was a nice gig. That was a yes, nice gig. Yeah. Um, although it did cause me, you may not realize it, it did cause me a little bit of a hassle for about three months afterwards. It did because <laughs> yeah, because right at the end of the talk, Richard Dawkins, who was in the front row, stood up and thanked me for it and said he really enjoyed it. He then tweeted the same, and my follower count on Twitter went up by about <laughs> two hundred people, and there were two hundred Dawkins haters. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, Dawkins said something nice about him. Let's troll him now. And That's... yeah, I, ju- I just had all, all these sort of flat earth lunatics and and yeah. and sort of anti evolution people just just constantly bombarding me with tweets and links to websites <laughs> to show me that evolution's <laughs> evil and wrong. And yeah, so it, it's a it's a mixed blessing having a well done from Richard Dawkins. I have to say. <laughs> yeah. I, wow. How about that? Because I remember that it, the exact event when Richard Dawkins stood up and, and congratulated you on your talk. Now you were talking. Uh, you gave a talk based on a book you've written called "Why Did the Policeman Cross the Road?" Yeah. The, the, the title "Why Did the Policeman Cross the Road" came up um, because it, it, it's a story basically of moving from a, a different viewpoint to policing. Because um, I, I was a police officer in London for 30 years. And, and when I first joined, the police was very much a responsive organization. You know, someone someone dialed, as it is here, 999, and, you know, the police turned up and dealt with the call. And, and there was very little going on in terms of preventative work. In fact, most London's divided up into 32 boroughs. And on those 32 boroughs, there's usually only one police officer who's got any kind of responsibility for crime prevention and everyone else is just mopping up after the crimes happened. And I kind of went on a journey across that 30 years, realizing that what we should be doing is, this is me crossing the road from sort of reactive to proactive. What we should be doing is actually stopping the crimes from happening. Because if you 
if you t- if you take a, a representative sample of, of you know 150 people in the street and you say to them you know would you rather the police are really really effective use their money effectively um you know and are really good at catching bad guys and putting them in prison or, or would you rather that you didn't get robbed in the first place i know what everyone would go for you know um there, there are all sorts of problems inherent with it because it's it's very easy to measure success in terms of things like arrests and successful prosecutions and prison populations and all that sort of thing. It's it's very difficult by comparison to measure prevention, whether what you've done is responsible for a, a downturn in crime figures and whether those crimes would have happened had you mm. not done what you've done, mm. which was why it was always a bit of an uphill battle. But that's kind of what the book was about. It's about that journey and realizing that what policing should be about. And indeed, what policing was set up for, if you go back to the very origins of organized policing uh, back in the 1800s and Sir Robert Peel, that the very first mission statement for policing, which, which became the template for what was then the whole British Empire, starts by saying that the primary object of an efficient police is the prevention of crime. The you know, it says that crime, that's yes. what, yeah, that's what the police was set up for. And its second purpose is to is to investigate crimes and 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 track down and and prosecute offenders when crimes have been committed. But the primary object is prevention. Right. And yet, when I joined in 1980, there, there was almost no prevention going on at all. So that that's that, that was the thrust of the book. And and this attitude is what led you to help in these situations with the flats and uh, using dogs. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the, the one you mentioned with the the dogs, um that that was a a particularly troublesome housing estate in South London that had it had an emerging gang problem. I mean, nothing of the scale that you get in places like LA uh, and things like that, but nevertheless an emerging problem where a lot of disenfranchised kids who had absent fathers, who's uh, mothers quite often were, were absent or working all day or were alcoholic or for whatever reason didn't have a, a, a large degree of control over them, were actually sort of forming their own families in the form of these these kids that hang out together. And eventually, you know, a strong individual who has a more criminal mind basically starts pushing them down the line of becoming a gang. And this was an emerging problem. There have been a few stabbings. Um, there have been a lot more stabbings than had been reported to police. I found that looking at alternative sources of information, such as talking to um, the casualty departments, uh, accident emergency in the local hospital, revealed a lot more stabbing injuries than had ever been reported to police. Wow. So the problem was much worse than we thought it was. And um, and it all culminated in a young lad getting killed um, by a rival gang. And that's when everyone, politicians, local politicians and uh, council leaders, really sat up and took notice that something needed to be done. Um, I think what upset them most was when the funeral took place was the fact that the lad's coffin was being carried by members of his gang wearing sort of bandanas over their faces rather than family because he had no family. Wow. The gang was his family. Uh, and it was it was a very political hot potato at the time. And um, so they, they asked the little team that I worked with at Scotland Yard to have a look at it. And as we've often found when we've looked at communities like that, the reason the gang's get a toehold and the reason they, they get to control things is is that the community is very fractured this particular estate it, it, it was a i mean london's a real melting pot anyway i mean there's i think there's over 120 languages spoken in london and this estate had had you know three or four distinct cliques and they kept to themselves they didn't mix uh, and amongst it all were these were these kids you know who nearly all had absent parents usually an absent father right and, and and the community was very fractured. And what we found in previous instances that weren't quite as serious as this is that if you started to fix the community, if you started people looking out for each other, crime drops rapidly. I mean, you, you probably remember there's, there's a little story in the book about just simple things like pulling your neighbor, neighbor's plastic wheelie bin off the street once the dustmen have been round right. can reduce burglaries because the burglars use the bins that are out on the street to figure out who's not at home. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they haven't taken their bins in, um, and just putting in a bit of community spirit and getting you to take your neighbours' bins in reduces, you know, it reduced burglary by forty, fifty percent in times. Wow! So we thought, how can we bring this community together? Because it was very, very broken. You know, no one talked to anyone. They crossed the street to avoid each other. <laughs> a lot of people were too scared to go out. There were certain areas that were almost like no-go areas that no one went to. Finding points of commonality is very different. It's very difficult when you've got people from a lot of different ethnic groups 
and and we we tried different things we tried a a world food day which didn't work very well we tried uh, using an old uh, abandoned shop as a kind of community center or a youth club and someone burnt it down <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there were there were there were various attempts and then and then one day we were walking around that estate myself and a colleague and a couple of the local uh, police officers and we're just trying to think of this any points of commonality and then and i can't remember to this day which one of us said it i'm pretty sure it wasn't me but certainly one of the little group of four of us who were walking around noticed that almost everyone we could see had a dog and uh my colleague who worked in the problem solving unit with me suddenly sort of said what about a dog show we sort of thought dog show really um but the more we thought about it we thought well dogs are a great bridge you know if i if i see someone across the road who's you know walking along with a nice husky or something if i walked if i if they were just walking down the street on their own and i walked over to them and said hi i'm steve they say whoa it's a lunatic um <laughs> but if i go over and say oh god your dog's gorgeous blah, 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 i've got i've now got an excuse to talk to that person right it's like the dog the dog has become a bridge between those two people because it's it's a point of commonality it's a point of common interest you know in the same way that people who you know join a a, a stamp collecting society now have an excuse to talk to other people because they've got some common ground to talk about. And and so we decided to try this dog show and it was run with the local police and with a couple of dog related charities and uh, dogs homes. And we had the police dogs come in and do a display, you know, jumping through fiery hoops and all that sort of thing. What was amazing was seeing people who would never, ever, ever talk to each other. Um, Doing so, I, I mean, the thing I remember most, that the image that stays with me forever, I think, was a, of a little old lady, must have been in her 80s, with a with a Yorkshire Terrier. Uh, and she's she's having a go at this big black lad in a hoodie who's got some kind of Staffordshire Bull Terrier cross. And he's she's having a go at him because his dog's too fat. <laughs> now, these were people who would have crossed the road to avoid each other right. in any other circumstance because she would have been a little bit scared of him. And he would have thought, oh, interfering busybody. Blah, blah. But they were across it. And here she was having a go at him. She was in the position of power because even though he's this huge lad with this big, scary dog, his dog's <laughs> overweight. And she's telling him this. And and he's taking advice. He's writing down what he should be buying to feed the dog. And, wow. and it was the first little chink in the armor of trying to make this right. Because if the community comes together and starts to look after each other, then, you know, there's all sorts of benefits, apart from the fact that it it, it takes the control away from the, the the emerging gang. It also means that you know this this huge problem we've got at the moment with loneliness, this epidemic of loneliness, particularly in old people, that that gets dealt with as well. People start feeling more confident about walking about, and then the increased footfall means that there's less chance for cr- crime to operate. There's more people out in the street watching what's going on. And um, I went back to visit that estate sort of about 18 months later, shortly before I retired. And I can't pretend, you know, it it was now all lovely and la-la and it was, uh, you know, the best place in the world to live, but significantly better. People out walking about, there was a communal sort of garden that the residents had put together. And more importantly, there was talk about tearing down half that estate and building different housing there. And of course... Unfortunately, what seems to happen at the moment is they tear down a council estate and then what up is housing that the people who lived there before can't afford to live in. Uh-huh. So so there was a there was a campaign going by people who now they had a community wanted to stay together if they were rehoused. Interesting. So, yeah. So the community had actually formed to such an extent that the people wanted to stay together. So and, and crime had dropped substantially. I think I can't remember the exact figure. But I have in my head. I've got something about 35 percent. That's one thirty five percent drop in crime. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. that's and admirable. Just from, and I'm sure, uh, just from a dog show. And I'm sure any uh, uh, police uh, force in the world would be envious of that sort of a, a drop in crime because it solves all sorts yeah. of problems and frees up police time for other investigations, which is always a plus. Absolutely. This this is the point, you see, that, that you know, when the police are running around all the time chasing their tails, trying just trying to catch up with the number of calls they got coming in. You, you sort of realise that if you can stop those calls coming in in the first place, the police have got more time to investigate the crimes they have got to deal with. Yeah, and yeah. You know, it, it's ev- everyone's happy. And I know in places where this has been taken on board, big time. I mean, I mean you talk to the local. I, I went to Charlotte, in North Carolina, 
a few years ago and and did some work with the local police there where they've adopted this big time this this whole process of problem solving it's what they call in america problem oriented policing or pop and um and talking to the police officers there they said they'd never actually been happier they said when it first came in they thought oh this is all a bit academic and a bit airy fairy and you know and i just want to catch bad guys but once they got into the swing of it and realized that they were now i mean if, if for no other reason the community became part of policing policing with a small p you know they had all these extra thousands of pairs of eyes helping them to keep the city safe and right and as a result you know it was just hugely popular with the police as as always when you look at a problem you you've got to talk to every person concerned i mean i don't know whether you remember this from the talk but i said you know that every problem's got three components there's there's someone or something that's causing the problem there's someone or something that's affected by the problem and there's a place in time and space where those two come together and the secret to cracking problems is to, is to disrupt that triangle you know it, with traditional policing a lot of that was focused on catching the bag by because if you take away the cause of the problem then haha no problem except that there's nearly always someone else coming to take that slot there's always a motivated <laughs> defender so so if you can break the other sides as well if you can change people's behavior so that they're less likely to be a victim that means that even if that slot is filled again they can't operate or if you can change features of the location so that the very reason the bad guys chose that spot to commit their crime if you can change that location and take away those features then again, the crime can't happen. And if you can hit all three sides at once, bang, no problem. And and part of that involves talking to people who represent all three sides of that triangle. Well, it's, uh, there's, there's so many aspects to this. And folks, I can only truly recommend the book, Why Did the Policeman Cross the Road? And I believe you can buy that now, of course, but I believe it's coming out uh, next year in paperback. Yeah, it, it, it's out there in hardback. And of course, you can get it from all the usual places, bookshops and online etc and yeah that as i understand it they're looking at bringing the paperback out in i think june next year which would be nice because it, it'll it'll increase the range of the book so it certainly will make it cheaper to uh post overseas well that's well. the other thing yeah yeah the postage is exorbitant going overseas so of course anything that reduces the weight is great yes <laughs> and speaking of books let's uh let's have a quick chat you have a uh is it a novel coming up yeah, I, I, I've made a bit of a, a break because, I mean, apart from doing all this sort of stuff, obviously my, my other great love is comedy. And uh, for the last sort of 11 years, I've been associated with or been one of the writers of the, the TV show QI, which is pretty popular in Australia. Very good. Um, yeah, I've, I've, been one of the, I've, I've been one of the script writers for the last four years. Um, and, yeah, comedy's always been a thing with me. And in amongst writing all the nonfiction books, I've, I've always written stories. I've always written novels. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to put a novel out there. So, of course, it's not completely divorced from policing because it is a, a comedy murder mystery. <laughs> right. And uh, and for me, the, the the whole idea for the book came from the fact that I love watching murder mystery and reading murder mystery. Love Agatha Christie, you know, love watching murder she wrote and all these right. sorts of things. But, of course, I was also a real cop. I've been at real crime scenes. I've been involved in major investigations, homicides, that sort of thing. And I always thought to myself, they're, they're, they're such worlds apart the way that sort of crime fiction and real life works. I thought, what if I could throw those two cultures at each other? So what I've written is a book called A Murder to Die For, which is about a murder that takes place at a murder mystery convention. <laughs> so what you so what you've got is you've got all these all these cosplaying crime fiction fans <laughs> wandering around and a real murder takes place and the police come in to deal with it with their very efficient uh, procedurally based way of doing things and they're up against all the crime fiction fans who think "Ooh, i've read everything by conan doyle i can investigate this too oh, and no. and a lot of the humor comes from that clash of cultures it, it was a joy to write i've really enjoyed writing it, it but it um, sounds great it sounds great it sounds great and that's coming out next year yeah yeah yeah, January the 25th i think it is oh pretty soon folks i noticed yeah, that there is already a link uh, to that book at Amazon, at least. I'll certainly link to that in the show notes, and I'll link to the the other book, too, Why Did the uh, Policeman Cross the Road? Well, I'd love to invite you uh, to come out to uh, Australia and do a tour of Skeptics in the Pub, but I'd have to join you just to make sure it, it runs smoothly. You understand, of course. Oh, you would, and we'd probably have to run a Kickstarter campaign and pay for my flight. <laughs> <laughs> I've just, I've just been, and, the, and the bar tab. Yeah, and the bar tab. Yeah, the bar tab, particularly. 
<laughs> it sounds it sounds delightful. I hope maybe one day we can make that happen. But until then, it would be thank, great. It would be great. Uh, look, thank you very much for your giving your time to the Skeptic Zone, folks. I can not recommend that book highly enough. It's a great read, and uh, Stephen is uh, a great man to see giving his public talk. So if you have the opportunity, do go along to see him. But for now, Stephen Colgan, all the way from the UK, thank you very much. Thank you. Here's some good news from the Australian Skeptics at skeptics.com.au, published on the 25th of September by Tim Mendham. Australian Skeptics Inc. offers funds for skeptical programs and activities. Australian Skeptics Inc., ASI, is committed to increasing and fostering the skeptical movement in Australia and consequently has a history of supporting various programs around Australia that promote our aims. With this in mind, ASI and the Australian Skeptics Science and Educational Foundation set up the Australian Skeptics Grant Program, which seeks to identify and support worthy organisations, individuals and events. In the past, we have funded a range of projects, including events, prizes, talks, scientific research, speakers' costs and operating costs of groups. Applications are now open for grants and seed funding to individuals and groups who are looking to set up or maintain skeptical organizations, projects, and activities. More information on the program and application forms are available at www.skeptics.com.au. Please note that grant requests may be approved in full, partially, or not at all. We give a higher weighting to grant applications that include multiple organisations working together, so applicants might consider teaming up not just with Australian Skeptics, but also with other organisations undertaking the same or similar activities to broaden their impact. So there you go. If you're involved in a sceptical activity in Australia and uh, you uh, possibly might need some funding the uh, Australian Skeptics offer might be for you. And now, direct from the cafe at Australia's Science Channel, it's Brouhaha. Science in less time than it takes to order a coffee. With Casey Harrigan. 225th birthday, Michael Faraday. I have to admit I didn't get you anything. But hey, thanks for all of the things you've given us. Firstly, cheers for inventing the electric motor. I use those all the time. Also, I think it's really cool that you coined the words electrode, anode, cathode and ion. Not everyone gives us a way to potentially score 54 points in a game of Scrabble. And hey, how can I forget to thank you for discovering benzene? You know what they say, you can never have too many hydrocarbons. And lastly, I want to thank you for the fact that, despite never being offered one, you went out of your way to publicly say that you would not accept a knighthood. That is a baller move. And in your honour, I'd like to publicly say that I couldn't possibly accept entry into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In all seriousness, Michael Faraday was one of the greatest scientific minds of all time. And whether you're inspired by his rags to riches biography, or you're just grateful for electricity, definitely worth celebrating his birthday. For more brouhaha and Australian science, visit www.australiascience.tv or visit Australia's Science Channel on Facebook. Hi, this is Ben Radford. And this is Pasquale Romero from the Squaring the Strange podcast. Every week, my co-host and I cast a skeptical eye on a different topic. Monsters, ghosts, demons, mysteries, and even current events are dissected and discussed with a fun, unscripted, and skeptical take that you're sure to enjoy. Find us at squaringthestrange.com, iTunes, or on your favorite podcast platform. Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Here's Iran Segev. Grain of salt now. Grain of salt. You got to 
Claire Klingenberg, Hi. how are you doing? <laughs> well, um, I'm very excited. <laughs> It's the first day of the Congress. I mean, we, you and I have spent a bit of time together in Prague, and, you know, and you're all still cheerful and, and happy, and uh, you don't seem stressed at all, although I know there are little stresses. <laughs> But uh, how do you feel so far? No, I think everything's going great so far. Everyone is really motivated and everyone seems to be having a good time and that's really important. So far we only heard from two speakers, uh, but I think the rest of the day will all go as well as the morning did and I think everyone will enjoy this Congress. What, what are your expectations over the next few days in terms of, uh, I mean, as an organizer you, you expect things to obviously to run smoothly and all of that, but what do you expect people to get out of the Congress? Well, we packed many different speakers uh, throughout these three days and I think people will get a very wide view of what all skepticism is about. That if, when you're a skeptic, which uh, of all the fields you can actually dabble in. And that's why we have such broad topics or such a broad selection of topics that uh, each, uh, so everyone can see, oh, okay, I can do this as a skeptic or I can do this as a skeptic. We start off with religion, but we're going to cover, you know, biology, we're going to cover media. So it's, going to, it's very, very wide spread of topic, topics. And you think you've got, you've struck the right balance in terms of the, the topics and the speakers? I think we have. We will see how it works out, if the chemistry between the speakers will be good at the panels and everything. But in, in general, I think we did, yeah. Okay, now about the organization. This is the first time that uh, an event of this kind has been organized by two different organizations, two different countries. Uh, how did that go? Uh, of course, there were bumps in the road, but I think in the end, uh, we're here. <laughs> so I, I see that as a very good thing. No. I think, of course, we had some differences in how to do certain things. But in the end, uh, we agreed on the speakers and we agreed on the program. And we especially agree on that we want to do the best Congress as we can and to give our attendees the best experience to have, that they can have. Okay, so you're organizing a big event with lots of speakers, lots of uh, attendees and all of that. And from experience, sleep isn't something that you get a lot of in the last few weeks. So you're st so have you somehow broken the mold and did manage to get some sleep or you're just cheerful even though you don't get enough sleep no I had hold the whole six hours tonight so I'm very happy okay that's, I think I think for most people listening to this they say six hours poor girl but you said the whole six hours I think we know where you're coming from yeah. okay so I will speak to you again after the conference and we'll right. see how you go then yeah okay. if thanks. you can wake me up yes thanks Claire all right Claire Klingenberg, I speak to you again, this time at the end of the European Skeptics Congress. Hi. You're still smiling. <laughs> What else am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so just tell me a little bit about yeah. what, I, what's happened over the last uh, couple three days. Of days. Uh, I think everything went great. That's the reason why I'm smiling is because everyone seemed to be happy. The speakers were happy. The attendees were happy. Uh, so, of course, the organizers are, are happy. Um, I think we had a really interesting selection of speakers and talks uh, from all type, different branches of skepticism. And uh, I think it was quite productive and um, very stimulating for people who went to see it. Do you have any, anything that you liked particularly? Unfortunately, I didn't see much of the talks, or it's always like a minute I had to run somewhere else in a minute. So I look forward to seeing the talks on YouTube because we're going to put all of the talks on YouTube. So then I'll have actually time to watch them. You have a special challenge in running this kind of event, obviously, in that you're trying to attract people from multiple uh, countries, multiple languages, and into just one of the countries. Um, how did this play out in terms of the kind of audience that we got here? What, what was the... Uh, makeup of the audience that you had here? So uh, we had a very wide variety of uh, nationalities here, but it was a little bit how we predicted that a lot of Polish people will come and a lot of people from Central and Eastern Europe will come, and that pretty much came true. So not many people from uh, overseas came. We had a couple of American guests, but not many. And, of course, we had you from Australia and two more people from Australia. So it, it was a very interesting variety of people. I think it was, that was also very nice that uh, all these cultures and nationalities could meet. That's great. Now, something else happened. After the, convention, after the conference ended, there was a meeting of EXO, the European Council of Skeptical Organizations. And I'm uh, pleased to say that you're the new president of EXO. 
I think it's chairman, but I guess okay. it should just <laughs> be chairwoman or chairperson, probably to be <laughs> to be yeah. correct. Yes, in I. New Zealand, in New Zealand, they used to call it. I don't know whether they still do, but they used to call it chair entity. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I love that. So I'm the new chair entity of EXO, <laughs> and uh, yep. So uh, we will see what all of that entails. Is there anything that you particularly like? I, I know that, you know it's. You were just elected for the position minutes ago, and uh, obviously you have a lot, a lot of time to work on the things that you want to work on. Is the if you had to choose one thing that you say is at the top of your priorities, what would that be? Make EXO important. I think that's the main priority because um, until two years ago, when we were um, given the Congress to organize, I never even heard of EXO, even though my my own uh, organization is a part of EXO. And when we were in the board meeting, that was something we all agreed on, that uh, EXO has to be more relevant. It has to be uh, influential, and it has to be known, and to be seen as a partner for uh, not just European uh, uh, European organizations, but for all skeptical organizations all over the world. Okay, well, we'll be happy to do our part in that partnership. Claire, thank you very much, and congratulations both on the great convention and on becoming president of EXO. Thank and, you. Or, Chair entity. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, this is Heidi Robertson from the Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters. We are a group of concerned citizens dedicated to promoting good science and common sense in our region, the far north coast of New South Wales. This area, famous for its natural beauty and relaxed lifestyle, also has the lowest rates of vaccination in Australia. We are out to change that by challenging the myths and misinformation and by providing good evidence-based information to the community. We'd love for you, no matter where you are in the world, to join our fight. Please visit our webpage at www.nrvs. Info. We also have a link there to our Facebook page. Tweet us at NRVAX supporters, that's V A X, and check us out on Wikipedia by searching for Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters. Thank you. Is a story that's been brought to my attention, published at The Independent, www.independent.co.uk. Published on the 24th of September 2017 by Rachel Roberts, homeopathic remedies are, quote, nonsense and risk significant harm, end quote, say 29 European scientific bodies. National Health Service has said it will stop offering the alternative treatment which has several high-profile celebrity fans. Now, this is a reasonably uh, lengthy article, so I'll just uh, cover some of the highlights. A scientific organization intended to influence EU policy has called for tougher regulations of alternative medicine, branding homeopathy as, quote, nonsense, end quote, and warning the, quote, promotion and use of homeopathic products risks significant harms, end quote. The statement was made by the European Academy Science Advisory Council, EASAC, an umbrella organization representing 29 national academies in Europe, including the Royal Society in the UK. Supporters of homeopathy and herbal medicine include Prince Charles, while Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn and Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt are among MPs who have signed motions in favour of it. Celebrities who are reportedly fans of the treatment include Usain Bolt, Paul McCartney, Jennifer Anderson, Hillary Clinton, David Beckham, and supermodel Cindy Crawford. The council did not mince its words in its condemnation of homeopathy, which works on the principle that like cures like, and that water can have memory. In a 12-page statement, the group summarized extensive scientific research and concluded that homeopathy is scientifically implausible 
and produces nothing more than a placebo effect in patients. It's said that homeopathic remedies can be dangerous because they may delay patients from receiving conventional medical treatment. Homeopathic remedies are taken by people hoping to treat a wide variety of disorders, including anxiety and asthma. And later on, the article says, a House of Commons Science and Technology Committee report on homeopathy found that homeopathic remedies performed no better than placebos and that the principles on which homeopathy is based are, quote, scientifically implausible, end quote. Last year, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission announced it would start enforcing tough standards on homeopathic product labels, including making sure that the labels clearly state there is no scientific evidence that the products work. Of course, for many years in Australia, we've lamented the fact that you could walk into just about any pharmacy and buy homeopathic products right off the shelf. And I do remember once years ago going into a pharmacy with Dr. Rachie when we were investigating these things and uh, asking the person behind the counter about homeopathy and they didn't have a clue what it was or how it uh, should work or was supposed to work. Like many people, they were under the mistaken belief that it's uh, herbal or natural or contains herbs or something like this. Now, in my archives, I've got the package scanned from a... uh, product called uh, Brower Natural Medicine Sleep and Insomnia Relief. Granted, this packet is some years old now. It's been in my files for a while. I think they've updated their packaging. But the important point to point out is that uh, on the back of the pack, it lists active ingredients. Each glucose tablet is medicated with, and so on, it lists ingredients like capsicum, for example, and coffee. Coffee in two different dilutions. We've got coffee at 4C concentration and coffee at 30C concentration. And uh, students of homeopathy and skepticism will know that these concentrations are uh, fantasy. Of course, they're so dilute that there's not even one molecule left, if there ever was one to begin with. And a point that's been brought to our attention many times, in fact, and it's a good point, is that uh, in Australia, at least, there are laws governing the uh, claims you can make on products, and especially the uh, the ingredients. Uh, I'm sure it's a legal requirement to list ingredients on a food or medicine package. So when a homeopathic product lists ingredients that aren't actually there, what what does that say about the law? Are they skirting the law? Are they flouting the law? Is this some law I don't know about where you can list uh, imaginary uh, ingredients on a package? And another point to remember is that uh, there is an argument that homeopathy as a uh, product doesn't actually exist. It's a process. It's only a process because the product produced at the end of it is indistinguishable from, say, a sugar tablet. So in that respect... Uh, even though this packet in front of me says right at the top, homeopathic product, is it? Homeopathic product, indications, relief of sleeplessness and insomnia. Dosage, adults, two tablets. Children, two to twelve, one tablet. Hang on a second. In the homeopathic world, the weaker something is, the stronger something is. So they're suggesting that children should take a stronger dosage than adults. Yeah, that makes sense. And it goes on to say, if symptoms persist, consult your health care practitioner. And it doesn't say, if symptoms persist, consult your doctor or pharmacist. And indeed, in the media now, the uh, standard disclaimer for any medical products, headache tablets to whatever. If symptoms persist, consult your health care practitioner or your health care professional. Of course, if that health care professional includes a homeopath, <clears throat> I think you see my point. Anyway, homeopathy once more on the back foot, on the rails, on the ropes, and on the way out. Q 
QED 2017 is fast approaching and you don't want to miss it. In the past, QED has brought you the Arrows of Time, the origin of recording, an escape from the Westboro Baptists, the sex bias of sex science and all manner of other science, pseudoscience, activism, slacktivism and more. Plus, insects for breakfast. Mmm, yum. QED 2017 takes place on the 14th and 15th of October in Manchester, England. We've already announced speakers like Sophie Wilson, co-inventor of the ARM computer chip, Simon Singh, who will be showing how to crack a genuine Enigma machine, Phil Scrayton talking through the real-life cover-up of the Hillsborough tragedy, and physicists Helen Chersky and Tim O'Brien. We'll have a live show from the Parapod Boys, and the whole event will be emceed by ace magician Dave Anik. Have some laughs, meet some new friends, make new connections, all for only £109, including all the main stage talks, panels, podcasts, workshops, our Saturday night entertainment, and lots more. Check out qedcom.org for details. We'll see you in October. This is Susan Gerbic from the Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia project. I'm at the very end of the European Skeptic Congress here in Wachla, Poland. Well, they'll say it better, right? Anyway, so it has been a fabulous time. We've had a really terrific time. I think everybody would agree. And I'm here with two of my editors and also um, one of the mentalist speakers for the conference, Jacob. So um, let's see what they have to say. So Wakiria, who is one of my GSOW editors, what would you think? Well, it was great Congress. I think, well, I don't think. It's the first Eurocon uh, that I've been to. Uh, second Skeptic Congress. And I loved it. It had tons of psychology, with I, which I love. It had opposite views, which were interesting. And uh, it had James Randi, so I'm happy. Uh, (laughs) But no, I think it was great. It was great meeting so many interesting people, which I think is what I'm going to take out of this. It's you, You don't realize how interesting, how different, but how much like the community is. So you get to learn a lot from everybody. Okay, and Ryan, who's also one of my GSOW editors, what do you got to say? Um, I, the conference was amazing. I uh, loved all the talks. Um, fantastic things from Susan Blackmore, from you as well, Susan. Good to meet you as well in, in the flesh for the first time. Um, and Let's not get it was, personal. No, <laughs> in the person for the first time. Good to meet you in person for the first time. And um, it's also really awesome just the you get to talk to so many skeptics, um, some of whom we've met at QED before, um, and you know, you just get out like a house on fire straight away, and you've got so much in common, you've got so much common ground to start with, that you can easily get into a really great conversation uh, straight away, and I really encourage, uh, like you say, Susan, get along to conferences, and you meet a lot of like-minded people and have a great time. So one of the highlights of the... Um one of the highlights of the conference, I thought, was that they had an exorcism panel and an exorcism movie and a man who, what would you say? He's a believer in exorcisms and support of the Catholic Church and so on. It was, it was fantastic having him here and listening to how people politely debated him and talked to him and... Um, he stayed at the whole conference, so I would be interested in his thoughts. But Jacob, who is a uh, mentalist right? mm-hmm. and from the Czech Republic, and Jacob put on a mentalism show, hypnosis mentalism show, that kind of showed how exorcisms actually could just be from suggestion. So, Jacob. Yes, Hold it. you are right. Uh, I don't believe in the possession. And I presented my experience with these states of minds, which are labeled as devil possession. So, and so I presented that it is only suggestion, your imagination, yeah, your creativity. I really enjoyed it. I am happy that uh, in the audience there were some people who weren't afraid of, of my presentation, because sometimes when I presented these things, uh, uh, people uh, afraid of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are scared from this. Really? Yes. They are sitting on their chair, and when I 
say, uh, if you want, let's come here and try it. Mm -hmm. They sitting still and doesn't move. So uh, I'm very happy that here in Vroslav, uh, a lot of people came and yeah, we enjoy it. And uh, Prill just walked up to us right now, and uh, he uh, came all the way from uh, Berlin. Berlin, but via Russia before, right? I, I lived in Russia before. That's correct. So, what do you think of the Congress? You came because you came because James Randi was here, right? Well, uh, I came here to meet uh, my friends, uh, to see my friends, and James Randi, of course, as well. Um, yeah, I think it was a great Congress. Uh, so I felt that the difference was that somebody who did not agree was here and was really prominently uh, there on the first day. So I think this was something that rarely skeptics do. I think this is also useful because it showed that people are not able to talk to people who they disagree with. Uh, they were, uh, like, when they were arguing with this guy, it was clear that people were not experienced doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this is a lesson to all skeptics that, hey, if you want to if you want to bring your message to the public, you have to really go for it. You have to learn how to do that. So I think this was really interesting. This was new. Yeah. yeah. I, I really, I think that was the highlight. Well, actually, there were so many wonderful things happening at this conference. and But I do think that stands out of my mind, the having an exorcist-related person here to stay through the whole Congress. And I guess he went out with beers and had beers with people and things. Yep. Yeah, he seemed like he was a very personable kind of guy, but he, as soon as he got on stage, I said, wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. Is it, I didn't know if it was his accent that I was having trouble with understanding what he was saying or if it was... I just thought it was a joke. Like, he's going to bring his case, you know, lay, lay it out and then explain why it's wrong. But no, he kept going. <laughs> It was, it was very interesting. So anyway, Skeptic Zone listeners, we um, we all are saying hello from... Where are we at? From Wroclaw. Poland. Thanks, guys. Svenska skeptiker. Du vet väl att vetenskap och folkbildning inte bara är trogna anhängare av The Skeptic Zone utan också arrangerar föredrag, pop science quiz och skeptiker träffar runt om i Sverige. Gå in på www.wof.se för att spana in vad våra sju olika lokalföreningar runt om i landet har på gång. Och om du bor i en stad där det inte finns någon lokalförening, varför inte starta en själv? Jag pratar med dig, Umeå. Hello, all skeptics in Sweden. I'm sure you already know that the Swedish Skeptics Association not only is a big fan of the Skeptic Zone, but that we also organize lectures, pop science quiz and skeptics in the pub all over the country. Go to www.vof.se to see what our seven local chapters are up to. And if you live in a place where there is no local chapter, why not start one yourself? I'm talking to you, Umeå. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Now, at the top of the show, I said we had a message come in via Voice Byte. And if you want to use Voice Byte to send The Skeptic Zone a comment or a question, please do so. Uh, links on skepticzone.tv or you just go to your app store or your uh, Google store and get uh, the application Voice Byte. Record your short question, tag it with Skeptic Zone, and that gets uh, straight to me. It's a really convenient system for sending voice messages. Anyway, anyway, here's the latest one that's come in. Hi, Richard. I was just wondering whether the Skeptic Zone podcast is going to be part of Skepticon in November in Sydney. I hope so. And that message was from Rebecca Jones. Listen, Rebecca, thank you for that. And the answer is yes, the Skeptic Zone will be at the Skepticon in uh, November in Sydney. We're working on the details now, but there should be a live session, a live recording of The Skeptic Zone, starring some of your favourite reporters from the show. Looking forward to that. More details in the coming weeks. So those people who are coming to Skepticon and would like to see a live recording of The Skeptic Zone podcast, 
you're in luck. Oh, and if you do want to send a voice message to the show, of course, if you uh, tag it uh, uh, Skeptic Zone, you can also tag it Maynard or tag it Heidi or tag it Mandy or just say in your message a question for, a question for Maynard. Where do you get your hair gel or something like that? <laughs> or a question for Heidi, uh, a question to Mandy Lee Noble about uh, dietary uh, information she might be able to help you with. A question to Dr. Rachie or a question to Aran Segev, the globe trotting Aran Segev. Look forward to getting lots of those questions and comments via voice bite. Coming up on next week's show, as mentioned before, Aran Segev chats to James Randi and Massimo Polidoro. Oh, and just before I go, speaking about uh, doing uh, uh, live events, I've heard along the grapevine, along the whisper, the word on the street is soon. Sometime in November, it looks like there will be a live recording of Bunga Bunga with Maynard and Tim Ferguson. Tim from the Doug Anthony All-Stars, of course. Now, Bunga Bunga, of course, is the award-winning comedy podcast. And I think that's going to be a, a great evening or afternoon. I'm not sure. It's all being put together at the moment. More details as soon as I know. But a live recording of uh, Bunga Bunga with Maynard and Tim Ferguson. As soon as I know all the details, I'll let you know. And it sounds like it'll be a f really fun event. In the meantime, you can check out Maynard's podcasts at maynard.com.au. But for this week, with Henrietta and more the Skeptical Cats not here, where are they? Oh, I think they're just outside the door waiting for their breakfast. For this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. You can be part of the show by downloading the Voice Byte app at voicebyte.com and using the hashtag SkepticZone. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. <laughs>